Tonight uh, we have uh, two speakers with us to talk about the CE marking of small and medium size uh, structural steel. So the lecture will outline the requirements of CE marking of structural steel in accordance with EN 1090 part 1, and in particular focus on small and medium scale structures. Our speakers, just first today to introduce Alberto de Santos with Omni Certification. He's a lead auditor uh, at Omni, and Omni Assure Certification International based in Tralee County Kerry. It's one of two notified bodies that can legally audit uh, EN1090. In Ireland, DNSA I being the other. He's both a qualified welding inspector and intermittent coatings training and inspector. And he has 16 years experience in compliance in the steel industry. Uh, we have a second speaker tonight as well, Pat Inright, the Irish Association of Steel Fabricators. He's the head of technical compliance and technical advisor to several notified and certification bodies. Through the Irish Association of Steel Fabricators, he promotes standards within the steel and concrete industry and coordinates technical training among fabricators in Ireland. So without that, without further ado, just like to hand over to uh, Roberto and we'll uh, get the evening started. Thank you. Okay, guys, so uh, first of all, welcome everyone. Okay, thanks for, for being here. And uh, so our aim here this evening is to uh, make you aware as possible of the N1090 and other standards that the N1090 associates uh, with, as uh, the people who write these standards call it, uh, they are harmonized standards. So you have the N1090 1 and dash 2 as a main standard, but there's so these standards that relates to the N1090 for an example, the standards for weld procedures, for uh, weld inspection, for qualifying welders, and so on. So there's a, a vast variety of other standards that uh, associate with the N1090, okay? So uh, my name is Humberto dos Santos. For those who people be wondering, I, I'm not local, okay? So I'm originally from Brazil, from South America. I'm in Ireland uh, just over 12 years, so uh, since of course, uh, uh, involved work with the N1090 system since it came out in Ireland back in the 4th of June of 2014. Uh, so that's the, the experience we had with the standards. Um, work, do a lot of work as uh, an auditor, uh, welding inspection is my background, welding. So uh, we do well used to weld procedures and quality and things like that, okay? So just to make a start on this thing. So uh, the contents are the background of C marking of structure steel and aluminium structures, okay? The scope of the N1090 uh, series, execution classes, design, relationship between the N1090 part one and part two, welding requirements, weld procedures, non-destructive testing, ISO 3834 series of standards. Uh, ISO 3834, you have five, <laughs> ISO 3834s, dash one, two, three, four, and five. There are uh, qual welding quality standards, really. So all of the welding quality criteria in the N1090 comes out of uh, ISO 3834, okay? Relationship between uh, 1091, two, and ISO 3834 series, as well as audit requirements. I have a, a couple of samples of welding procedures that are done uh, according to the N1090 at the very end, with have a look at, at those well procedures and what things mean and what tolerances and acceptance and thickness, range of thickness, range of approval, really, it's uh, very important to know, okay? Uh, I am not going to use that microphone at the moment, but if anyone, if you can't hear me at the back, I put it on, okay? So just, if you can't hear, just, just say, and I put the thing on, okay? Um, Questions, I suppose it'd be at the end, yeah, we'll have a cup of tea there at the end and we'll be very happy to answer any questions, okay? So the background, uh, so back in the 1st of June of 2014, it became a legal requirement in Ireland, okay? Any structural steel fabricator would have to be certified to the end and 90, the popular C marking to actually uh, fabricate or manufacture a uh, structural steel, okay? So it's actually a legal offense not to do so. So that's the, the clause under the Irish Construction Product Regulation that uh, make this a legal requirement, okay? So you have all of that there, it's on the, the notes you have uh, in front of you. 
So um, EM 109J-1 requirements for conformity assessment of factory production control. It's always important to remember that uh, EM 109J is factory production control. It's only what happens inside of a workshop of a factory. Once it goes out to a site, like whether they're coach drill with the modifications done to structures on site, unfortunately, it's nothing to do with this is standard, okay? It's factory production control. It's only what happens inside of workshops, okay? Um, EN 1090 Part 2 was revised recently, so the new EN 1090 2 2018 came out uh, early last year, about this time last year. It used to be 2009, I believe, the previous version. So, a few changes from the, the previous version. Um, with discuss a few of them uh, as we go along. Um, not much, but there were a few changes, especially regarding uh, execution classes, how to define execution classes, okay, and who defined this. Just as we are talking about it, the previous version of that, the end 90 2 which was the 2009 version of it, there was a clause in it that used to say, uh, if the execution class is not specified by the, the engineer, the designer, it would automatically default to execution class 2. So that clause is gone of the new standard. So now we have to specify and write in the job spec on drawings what the execution class of the job is. Okay. So the fabricator can no longer assume it's going to be execution class 2. Okay. That's the first thing an auditor goes to when he, he comes to the design clause while auditing. Okay. Is there is the execution class defined by the the structure design, okay, the engineer. Uh, so that's one of the main changes. We'll discuss a few more as we go along. Um, so both of the above are mandatory for steel structures. EN 1093 is uh, for aluminum structures, okay? So EN 1090 dash one and dash two is mild steel and there's dash three for aluminum structures. So uh, scope of uh, EN 1090. So as mentioned already, it's factory fabrication only, no site erection, no site installation, no site modifications. Okay, so once it leaves the, the gates of the structure steel manufacturer, it's nothing to do with this standard anymore. We can't do a thing about it. Um, it's probably going to, I know there's this question that will pop up uh, later, it always does. Um, it is probably going to come in on the next revision. So let's say four or five years down the road, they'll probably revise the standard again, and it more than likely will come in site welds, erection, any repairs, and any modifications on site. So we'll be looking for uh, qualifications and traceability of everything that uh, happens on site as well. But at the moment, it's only factory production control. It's only what happens inside of the workshop. Products where EN 1090 is mandatory are those that cannot be covered, are defined in EN 1091. There is a, at the back of the, the notes, there's a list, uh, it's, a clari it's called clarification of the scope of EN 1090-1. So you have a list there of 57 items that are covered under the scope of EN 1090, and then there's a second uh, B, bullet point B, it's uh, what is not covered under the scope of the EN 1090, okay? So it's there on the notes for your reference. So as an example, uh, number 50 is structural steel components for composite steel and complex structures. There's another one that is to structural frame for building warehouses, schools, hospitals, dwellings, industrial and agriculture, uh, agriculture sheds. Structure frames for shelters. So those are just a, a couple of examples of what should be, uh, what has to be covered uh, by EN 1090. And then you have another few examples there of uh, a few uh, items that are not that do not go under the scope of EN 1090. Usually uh, things like steel lentils, according to if there is another EN standard. Behind that product, it's, it usually doesn't fall uh, under EN 1090. There's another standard dictate how the, the thing should be manufactured. 
so just to start uh, going through terminologies and the technicalities of the standards. Um, so the market is the consumer and user, you and me. This is how they standard, uh, that's the terminology of the standard, okay? The regulator are the local councils enforcement. It's not really happened yet, but hopefully we're gonna get there, okay? Um, the manufacturer is the organization placing the product into the market, so you're still fabricators, okay? Um, normally the builders, construction companies, the, the porters are uh, of the fabrication. So um, that's the manufacturer, should I say, say the fabricator is the manufacturer. So the fabricator is the yet and manager certified enterprise, uh, the notified bodies client. So the people we go out auditing, okay? Um, just as uh, trying to get ahead of the few uh, a little bit, rumor has it, that uh, in July this year, any structural steel fabricator doing execution class three or four work will have to, to uh, comply with ISO 3834-2, which is the more stringent welding criteria, welding requirements standard, okay? So they're basically gonna have, their audit will, their audit will comprise the two standards. So as well as having all the, the things, the bits and pieces for the end 90 there will be extra to comply with ISO 3834. It's a, it's pretty much ISO 3834 requires written procedures for everything, how to restore consumables, how to identify parent materials for traceability and how to qualify well procedures. So it's pretty much there'll be a lot of uh, written procedures even for going to the toilet almost, okay? So uh, that uh, that should put the number the numbers of structures steel, structure steel manufacturers to execution class three and four, you should cut it to half because some of them are not really up to it. So once they see the amount of extra work that the new uh, requirement will require, they're more than likely will just go down to execution class two, okay? So it is uh, a good change. So service providers and certification and inspection companies such as uh, providers of welding tests, NDT, non-destructive tests, okay, uh, X-rays, ultrasonics, magnetic inspection, dye pen, that kind of a thing, even visual inspection, calibration and maintenance services, calibration of welding plants and handling equipment and so on, any uh, equipment that requires calibration, uh, subcontracted service providers, excuse me, so uh, in two execution classes now, so since the end 1090 became mandatory, okay, there was an old BS standard, we're with, gonna with, mention it there in the next couple of slides, which was BS 5990. So that standard was withdrawn from the 1st of July of 2014, okay. Structural steel design has to be compliant with this standard, okay. EN 1993-1, Euro codes 3 for uh, structure steel. There's uh, again Euro codes, there'll be a series of, your <coughs> should be familiar with that, there's a, there's a few different Euro codes there for the different uh, types of the structures. So just briefly on uh, what is looked at when deciding execution class of uh, buildings. So define the consequence class first, you have three criteria there. Select the service category, you have two criteria there. Select the production category, you have uh, one, two there. Then you look at a graph and it should give you a, an execution class, okay? Not going to, I'm not going to uh, go too deep into this. I am not an engineer by any means. I just know enough to audit the thing, okay? So it's up to engineers to understand the, the standard and execution classes. On the next slide or two, there's more uh, detailed explanation on execution classes. So here we go. So typically, uh, typical examples of the types of buildings that fall under the, the four execution class classes, should I say. So execution class one typically comprises structural components made of steel strength up to S275. It's, it's really, it's farm buildings. Execution class one is farm sheds, farm buildings very little requirement. The fabricator that just certified to execution class one only doesn't even have to do a well procedure, just qualification. 
to the stuff to the harmonized stuff that even the NPM manager is is over to do this farm buildings. Okay, there's no traceability to spread it either. So I don't think they really care about the poor farm. So okay. So execution class two typically comprises all support structures made of steel oak tree strains S700. Now, on my 12 years in Ireland, I never came across that uh, a project with that such a high grade of steel in it. Okay, the highest I've seen is S460, and then it, there's alarm bells go go on all over the place. There's preheating. There's new well procedures to be qualified. And, Requires external an external uh, welding coordinator with a higher level of qualification experience to, to keep an eye on the job, keep rec uh, record all the preheating temperatures, do the other calculation. Is there's a lot uh, of work involved in this? Okay, so uh, some of you may have uh, came across this. I, I never did. It's the highest highest I've seen is S one hundred and sixty, uh, and. It gets very complicated. Okay, so you're talking about getting well the engineers involved in looking at mill source, finding carbon content to work out preheating and post heat treating temperatures, things like that. Um, it can be uh, there's a lot of work involved. So uh, typically includes buildings uh, be which uh, between f one and fifteen floors. So ninety percent of the buildings in Ireland will fall under under uh, execution class two. It's only our commercial industrial buildings, okay? Um, like, I don't know of any building in Ireland that goes up to 15 floors. So it's mostly it's execution class two, okay? So when we go into execution class three, it's again, it's up to that grade steel. And then we are talking about bridges, uh, high rises. Um, some school halls are being classed as execution class three because you. The fourth criteria that people look at is the risk of uh, for human life or risk to risk to the environment. So when you think of a stadium, for an example, that you could have 50 to 60,000 people inside of it, if that structure collapses, you, you have a high number of uh, human lives at risk. Okay, uh, so that's the main idea behind it. So it basically comprises uh, buildings of 15 floors or more, pedestrian, bicycle, or road. Railway bridges and credit tracks. Okay, execution class four is a very rare, extremely rare. Usually, it's execution class three with a few extra requirements on the welding and the, the traceability and so on. Um, to my knowledge, execution class four jobs in Ireland, uh, one was partly with parts of it, and the children's hospital in Dublin as well. That's that's been done to ex done to execution class. For I'm not aware of any other building in Ireland that's uh, doing or being going to execution class four. Okay, so um, again, the end 90 dash 2018, the new version of the end 90, uh, it pretty much excludes execution class four. It's all the criteria of execution class three, which whatever extra requirements a engineer decides to uh, add to the to the project. Now you were talking about nuclear power plants, things like that. Uh, okay, so it doesn't really happen. Very hard to come by execution class for jobs. So uh, the designer, structure, uh, the structural engineer that hands the structure over are responsible for the execution class for the structure, along with the structure calculation design, the component details, materials to be used, and specification and test requirements that are different to EN 1090-2, clause 12.4, uh, other specification and ancillary items for an example. Okay, so going back to my uh, first comment there, uh, it does not default to execution class 2 anymore, so it has to be specified, okay, while the, the design is, is being uh, made by the, the structural engineer. For a fabricator, if he's caught on an audit now without having the, the execution class defined, that's a major non-conformance. He more than likely is going to to lose his certification, or he'll, he'll be big bother to to work around this. Okay, so it's uh, very important. Uh, one of the main changes of the new standard is uh, this one, who decides the 
the definition of the execution class, okay? So the fabricator most not, cannot decide the execution class unless they also take responsibility for the design. Now, some of the larger structure steel fabricators will employ uh, uh, internally a structural engineer. So then he'll be deciding because he, he'll have a, a competent person to do as such. So in that scenario, he can decide the, uh, the execution class. Or in some cases where uh, design can be added to the scope of uh, the N1094 structure steel fabricator if he approves a subcontractor. So let's say if he approves one of E to be his subcontractor. So he will use one of E to do the provide the other design calculations. So in that in those two scenarios, uh, it will be okay to for the fabricator to decide the not really the fabricator, be his structural engineer to decide the execution class. Okay. Most determine the execution class before commencing the fabricator. So again, if a, a job is back going, no execution class, he has to get back to to the engineer, what's the story here? What am I to do, okay? Even things like, uh, again, comparing the older version to the newer version. The older version, once it goes into execution class three, you are not allowed to even punch holes on plates. It has to be drilled or thermal coating or some plasma or laser port. Now, they can, unless the engineer say no, has to be drilled or whatever, execution of holes, okay? So in that, there's a, there was the addition of thermal coaching procedures, automated thermal coaching procedures, CNC plasmas, and uh, laser machines, which there is a discount at the very end of August. Okay, so those are kind of uh, the main differences between uh, old and new version of uh, EM1092. Can you all hear? Find that at the back, yeah? Okay. <coughs> So the N1090-1 requirements for conformity assessment of the structural components. So uh, the first five here is like every standard will have these is called norm normative uh, references, terms and definitions requirements. So this is not this is not auditing at all. It's from clause six that uh, the auditing process starts. Okay. So you have uh, general. Uh, what the FPC is, what comprises, what entails, the, what documentation is it, an electronic system or is it hard copies, uh, procedures and policies and things like that. Uh, initial type testing, we'll speak about in the next slide or two, I think. Um, it's here at 6.3 is where the audit really uh, starts. So you have uh, 6.3.2 for an example is personnel. You were looking at the welders. Are the welders qualified to the appropriate standard? Okay. Um, you were looking at uh, it goes a little bit into health and safety, especially handling equipment. What the clause say is uh, the likes of forklifts, for an example. They have to be uh, thoroughly examined once a year. So he he has to have a GA1 report for his his forklifts, for an example, as well as gantries, overhead gantries. They have, what the clause says is any malfunctioning equipment that may uh, cause damage to the steel. So a malfunction forklift might bend, might damage the piece of a hollow section. <coughs> For an example, so there has to be a driver certified to drive that forklift. Okay, that's pretty much the health and safety uh, part that is uh, approached in uh, yet uh, not just, it's handling equipment uh, really. So you have 6.3.3 uh, equipment, again, should have a full list of all the equipment, capacity of forklifts and cranes, what they can lift. Uh, it's where the fabricator should demonstrate control of dates, when, when a sort runs out of date, when do I have to calibrate my welding plants, things like that. So the, there should be uh, predetermined dates for all those things on an infrastructure loan. Okay, then uh, the design part of it, design process. Okay, uh, in this here we look at uh, any uh, software packages used. Does it comply with uh, Euro codes? Okay, uh, some of, some of the older ones, <coughs> the older uh, software packages don't. Um, competence really of you're looking at professional indemnity insurance here at this. Okay, of whoever the uh, the engineer is, things like that. Qualifications, competence. Okay. Uh, constituent products is uh, steel, okay, 
uh, traceability has to be C marked. Welding consumables, again, traceability has to be C marked, has to have a sort with a C mark in it. Bolts comes into it as well, has to have traceability for bolts, uh, things like that. Component specification is uh, the job, really, job specs, drawings, execution class defined by the, the structure steel engineer. Okay. Um, Product evaluation is uh, what we call on process uh, traceability. It's uh, inspection during, before, and after weld. Okay, after welding. It's uh, what else goes into here. It's uh, a lot to do with traceability as well. So you, you need to be able to uh, execution class two is partial traceability. So what most fabricators do, there will be a couple of root cards job cards going along with the job. So people sign who ports, who drills, who inspects, who welds, dates, signatures, uh, a traceability number for the steel used in that job. Some people use purchase order, other people write down hit numbers for steel, things like that. It's also required to have uh, traceability here at this stage of welding consumables, <coughs> welding wire, welding rods, things like that, okay? Um, so most of people use uh, root cards at this stage. If you're doing anyone doing execution class three or four work, it's full traceability. So you need to, to be able to say, let's say you have beam 101 in the job, you need to be able to say who welded that beam. Who welded the beam 102, things like that. It's full traceability. Which welding plant was used to weld this particular component on the job, okay? So there's a lot more work required on the traceability to execution class three and four. Uh, Non-conforming products, again, is a, if there's a clause, uh, all non-conformities have to be recorded. Things like weld defects, <coughs> uh, incorrect deliveries, deliveries missing yield sorts, things like that. So you should be, fabricators should be recording what goes wrong. It often happens that you go into, uh, let's say, a surveyed and salvaged into a steel uh, yard where they are certified for three years and there's nothing recorded. So you say, like, you've been doing this for three years and there wasn't uh, even a little, small little problem, you know? So if they're not doing it. So again, you'll be non conforming on that. Have to record things that go wrong, okay? The idea behind that is. Uh, Let's say if you have still supplier out there and he keeps sending you the wrong delivery week on week on week. So once you have a record of it, look, happened this week, happened the week after, what the hell? So that's the idea behind it. A welder making too many mistakes. <laughs> Peter, uh, Peter Murphy made a mistake on the job this week. Mistake again by Peter Mur Murphy on the Friday. Next week, the same thing. Sit down with Peter Murphy. Look, there's a log here. You made this mistake this day. For us, the next day, the weld was cracked. Next next week, what's the story? Do you need training or do you need a PFR to fire? That's the idea behind it. Okay, so that, then fabricators need to record problems. Okay, it's actually called problems and improvements here. If you look at the clause, so you record the problem to go into uh, into the improvement. Okay, so then you have. Uh, Classification and designation again to do with execution classes, and you have the marking. The marking is uh, it's your GOP declaration of performance at the end of the job. Okay, so all the, the certified structure steel fabricators, how they see mark the job is by issuing a GOP at the end. Okay, with their company names, the notified body name, their sort number, and obviously scope for certification and the standard. Uh, some people still want to get, some clients, clients still want to get mill sorts, things like that, but why and 1090, the requirement here is the GOP. All other things are checked by the, by the notified body uh, during audits, okay? So then you have initial type testing. Initial type testing here doesn't really uh, fall under uh, structured steel. The idea behind initial type testing is uh, its production uh, line really kind of you're making the same thing over and over and over and over. So you should uh, do tests at the, at the start of the, the production to demonstrate compliance. Buildings are, even though they look the same, but they might be of different heights, different names, 
difference is still size, so they are not, they don't fall under uh, initial type testing. Um, I think we only have out of our four or five hundred clients, there's only one that required to uh, do initial type testing, and uh, unfortunately, I can't tell you what it is. So that's the idea initial uh, on uh, behind initial type testing. Uh, just to give you a rough example, let's say if there is a a guy out there that is making uh, brackets for power lines or something like that. That's you know he's making the same thing over and over and over. So this is where uh, initial type tests will uh, will be required. So what is tested here basically is uh, destructive is non non destructive testing. So we do tests to the wells. We want to see uh, uh, mill source for whatever uh, steel is used. Um, there will be the likes of uh, X-rays and magnetic inspection, ultrasonic inspection in both wells. And then we go, uh, the next step is the structure test and just pull it apart, see, see what it can take really, destroy whatever is being tested. So that's initial type testing, okay, rarely doing in the structure steel. <coughs> so going back into uh, 6.3.4 with our <coughs> design clause. So in here we have, uh, just going to go down to the bottom there, okay, so must be carried out by the relevant Euro codes, for example, the N1993 Euro code C3 design of steel structures. Design is no longer in accordance with PS5950, which has been withdrawn, so Euro codes replace that boy there, okay. It's a major non-conformance again if you go out to a fabricator. And you look through the job spec, uh, that standard is mentioned there. It, it has happened, but uh, we usually get the, the engineer on the phone and he look, it's just a type, we didn't change the form. So once he assumes the responsibility as auditors, he's telling us, so off we go, okay, problem solved. Um, just a bit of inside information, what happens a lot here, uh, uh, at least with me. Uh, is when we're looking through job specs, a lot of times you see hollow sections specified as hot rolls, and then you go looking at the mill source for the traceability thereafter using a code form to stop. Again, major non conformity, okay? They should be, the fabricator should be getting back to the engineer and say, look, for whatever reason I can't get the hot rolls here, is it okay to use the, the code form? If the engineer says it is okay, he's, he's forward. Uh, I, it, it, it's the one thing that I like to. To always have a look while all is in your case. Today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did you come across that? No, it doesn't happen, yeah. <laughs> so again, uh, um, we cannot ignore uh, Brexit at the moment, okay? So most of those standards are called BSEN, whatever number. So uh, once Brexit happens, we still don't know what the rules, terms and conditions will be. Um, there probably will be a, a UK, some sort of, I think they're going to call it UK CA certification instead of CE. Probably going to be the same thing, the same standard, but I, I don't know. Don't know what to make of it myself. So um, just have to wait and see what's the story with Brexit so we can make a clear <coughs> plan for future. Main issues that could happen with Brexit, as you are probably aware of, uh, will be uh, wire so, uh, steel supplies. Okay, a lot of this steel is manufactured in the UK, the likes of uh, British steel, people like that. So it may not be recognised in Ireland anymore. Anything uh, approved by UCAS, the United Kingdom Accreditation Service, may not be recognised outside the UK after Brexit. So we still uh, we have to wait and see. Uh, what the terms and conditions will be when they uh, finally leave the EU. <clears throat> Again, it's still in structure design. Um, so the internal employee design, okay, so check the design and qualification are acceptable. This is what auditors will be checking, okay? Check the design brief, uh, check that their uh, approved calculations and drawings in accordance with the relevant euro codes, and so on. Okay, he keeps mentioning the National Structure Steelwork specification here. It's fifth edition. I think they're down to the seventh edition, isn't it? But it was 
this <coughs> here is actually wrong. So if you don't mind just to write a seven, that's the seventh edition, is the, the latest one. Okay. So again, it's written by uh, the British by BSI. So <coughs> don't know once Brexit happens, are we going to use it or not? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. So uh, outsource design again. Uh, any any jobs that require the fabricator to provide the design, if it doesn't employ a structural engineer, they'll have to have a an approved uh, subcontractor engineer. So you need copy of qualifications, PI insurance. Okay, you need to confirm that the design is doing bureau codes, things like that. Usually uh, a written letter or even an email of satisfy auditors in this uh, criteria here. All we want to know is that uh, uh, the engineer telling us that it is actually doing two euro codes, which is the what it should be happening, okay? So uh, drawing clearly defined the weld sizes, things like that, whether it is a fillet or a boat weld, and then once we get to weld procedures at the end, we'll uh, discuss that a bit better, okay? Let's just plug one a little bit. Another time. Okay. So, uh, well procedures qualification. Okay. So, execution class one, no need for well procedures. Well qualifications only uh, will do. Execution class two, three, and four, those require well procedures specification to be approved by uh, as per ISO 15609. Uh, but the good standard here that's use 99.5 percent of the time is ISO 15614 okay it's a uh, it's a uh, it's more restringent standards requires more testing better uh, weld qualities so that's the, the most used one that's why it is uh, in both letters there um, so the outsourcing of weld testing uh, to an accredited weld test provider like EIS like EIS uh, is here because we learn we have a good partnership with them. They're based in Dublin, and uh, that's why their their name is there. Okay. So basically, when uh, subcontracting uh, weld procedures uh, tests, we need to make sure that whoever is testing it is actually certified as well. Should have an ISO 9001 certification at least. Okay. All their uh, technicians uh, have to be approved to 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 EU standard as well, the EN standard. So. Um, if we stick to the main names out there, can't go wrong, okay? But there are, there are a few uh, chances around the place. So just be make sure that people are certified, okay? So uh, what entails qualifying weld procedures is basically a technician will come out to the structural steel workshop and witness the test, record jumps, bolts, wire speed, time that takes to do the weld, type of gas, grade of wire, flow of gas, speed, travel speed, things like that. So uh, obviously do a visual inspection to the to the weld then and then, and that's taken to a lab, non-destructive testing, destructive testing, the likes of uh, hardness tests, tensiles, macroscopic examination, it's all going to comply with uh, that standard there. Okay, so that's how the welding procedure is uh, approved. Constituent products is uh, material should be clearly specified and supplied to the relevant standards. For example, steel grades clearly defined for HFS 275 uh, and S355 and so on. Okay, so that would be the, the, the yearly standard for the manufacturing of those uh, steel grades. Just again, rectify their hot and low, hot, rolled and cold formed uh, hollow sections. Okay. Welding wire, there's an international standard for welding wire, it has to comply with that standard. This is all checked while you're looking at uh, C source for welding wire, for an example. That standard has to be mentioned there. You usually have the American standards and the, the ISO and the Indian standards. That's the one we look for, okay? Um, just briefly on this, just the difference between, uh, according to uh, EN 9204, uh, metallic products type specification documents. Uh, mainly, we have 3.1 and 2.1 types of uh, death certificates. The difference here is 2.2 .2 
it's in-house testing. So you are, let's say, if you think of a welding wire manufacturer, if he's issuing a 2.2 type of source to that standard, it means he's doing his tests in-house. He'll have his own lab in-house doing batch tests. If it is a 3.1 uh, type of sort, as well as his in-house tests, there'll be an independent uh, lab involved in the test. So 3.1 sorts is the sort you we, we want for uh, parent materials, steel. 2.2s are okay for uh, the likes of welding wire, bolts, and things like that. Uh, EN 1090 now makes clear reference to those two here at the bottom, okay? Galvanizing has to comply with that. ISO 14661. Painting has to comply with ISO 12944. Great emphasis on intermessing painting for the last two years, two to three years, okay? Um, the proper records here of environmental readings, humidity, temperature, dew point, things like that, even shock blasting, okay? There's a great, great requirements in that standard there for on painting, uh, which emphasis on intermessing paint, okay? Um, just like you should all be familiar with this, so that's the standard for the manufacture of this here, just what each uh, letter and number means, okay? I'm not going to uh, uh, speak too much on this. It's there if anyone wants to read uh, any questions at the end, we'll be happy to answer. So again, traceability of uh, constituent products, uh, execution class three and four, constituent products shall be traceable at all stages from receipt to handover after incorporation into the work. So as mentioned a while ago, execution class three and four is full traceability. The steel should be traceable at all the stages of the manufacturing process, okay? So there's a lot of paperwork involved here. Execution class two, three, three and four, if differing grades and uh, or qualities are of constituent products are, excuse me, in circulation together, each item shall be designated with a mark that identifies its, its grades. So you could have in a job um, S460 grades, a few columns, and the, the rest of it would be S355. So the different grades should be uh, clearly identified to stop. For an example, a welding wire, the incorrect grade of welding wire being used to weld the, the higher grade of, of, uh, of steel, which may cause uh, serious problems uh, down the road. So execution class three and four work. There will be a, a welding coordinator. His full-time work will really just keep traceability. It, there's a lot of work involved, a lot of paperwork, a lot of uh, signing off and checking and cross-checking. Uh, can be complicated, okay? So uh, RWC stands for Responsible Welding Coordinator. Uh, it, the responsible piece there will be knocked off on the new uh, EN 1090-1 is being revised at the moment. So when it comes out, it's, it's going to be welding coordinator only. Don't ask me why, uh, you still don't know why. Um, I think the confusion here was that the responsible welding coordinator that person's job will involve all the documentation required, okay, for the see marking traceability, as well as the, the work on the shop floor, weld inspection, keeping an eye on the welders, grades of things. So I think they're chopping that responsible off. It's going to become a welding coordinator, weld inspector. So kind of a clearer definition to what the job is. So there'll be a guy on the shop floor. And there'll be an administration staff in the office keeping all the, the paperwork required, things like that, okay? So again, it has to be certified to that standard, okay? And just uh, what is worth mentioning here quickly is uh, in execution class three and four mainly uh, would require uh, an external welding coordinator to be involved, okay? The, the standard clearly defines three levels of uh, knowledge and qualification. So you have comprehensive, specific, and basic knowledge, okay? So basic knowledge uh, usually is an experienced welder that will, he'll go away and attend. Uh, some people do the training in a day, some other places do two or three days. So it's basically an overview of the standards, the welding standards, welding quality, things like that. And the gain appreciation of visual welding inspection, Okay, uh, 
Uh, so he'll be at basic knowledge or WC. So he'll be okay to work in execution class two once the steel grades does not do not go above S355 or uh, is it 25 millimeter in thickness? Yeah, 25 millimeter in thickness. So he'll be okay to uh, give your WC in those jobs. If he goes to execution class three, you need a guy with a specific knowledge or comprehensive knowledge, okay? Uh, specific knowledge here will be uh, a welding inspector, which uh, has a minimum of there's a, Have you ever heard of C-SWEEP certification? C-SWEEP is certification scheme for welding inspection personnel. So you have to be at least at a level to C-SWEEP welding inspector, okay? And have a good understanding of the anti 90 Comprehensive here is your international welding engineer, the guy that went to college for three or four years. So you'll have a, a very detailed knowledge of uh, welding and uh, the different uh, welding processes and everything else that comes with it. Okay, so uh, there is a table in the end, 1090. I think there's a copy of it there on the next uh, slide. There you go. So B is basic, S is specific, C is comprehensive. So execution class two, steel grades up to S355, to those standards, thickness equal or less than 25 mil, basic knowledge will do. Anything above that, either specific, more than 50 millimeter in thickness, and I mean base plates, I mean uh, flanges of beams and columns, anything that goes above 50 millimeters, there should be a uh, <coughs> comprehensive knowledge welding coordinator involved in the job, okay? So this is for uh, carbon steel, mild steel. There is a table for stainless steel, slightly different, okay? So just keep going. So ISO 384, quality requirements for fusion welding of metallic materials. So execution class, Mandatory part of ISO 384, execution class 3 and 4, part 2, comprehensive quality requirements. Okay. Execution class 2, part 3, standard quality requirements. Execution class 1, part 4, elementary, elementary quality requirements. So, again, just to compare here into execution class 1, if you look at the table in, in 384, part 4, there, there is a table for uh, acceptance criteria for well defects for an example. So in execution class one, there be allowed uh, a certain extent of porosity, for an example, on a weld, okay? They are allowed to weld on top of primers in execution class one. Once you go into execution class two, cannot allow, cannot weld on top of any primer or paint, has to be clean, okay? Uh, not allowed, porosity at all. If you go into execution class four, you're looking at perfection really on welds, even a, a, a checking size of the weld. So you see, let's say if you have a drawing asking for an eight millimeter leg length village weld, the welding inspector, welding coordinator will have a gauge that he'll come and check, you know, 100% of those welds. The other thing that the standard says is at, as a very minimum, 100% visual inspection should be done to all welds, okay? Now, if you ask me, does that happen? The answer is no, okay? Nobody inspects anything 100%, and there's no point on going against it, unfortunately. So just an overview of what the differences are. ISO 3834, as mentioned at the start, is a welding quality at the standards, okay? That's all there is, really. It's very simple. It's very uh, uh, easy to understand, not too complicated about it. Okay. <coughs> Keep going. <coughs> so again, just emphasizing execution class one, there's very little requirement, part four has fewer, fewer clauses and lesser requirements and would be expected for execution class one, for an example. No requirements for qualified approved approved or documented well procedures. No requirement for calibration. It doesn't even have to calibrate the welding flange. Now, it is good practice. Some people do, others don't bother, okay? It's not a requirement. We cannot non-conform execution class one fabricators for not having a, a calibrated welding flange. No requirement for 
identification and traceability. So there's that. It, it, I find harder to audit an execution class one workshop than an execution class four. There's so little to ask you. A lot of times you ask too much and they give out at you. So it's, it's easier to do the, the hard one or you cover everything. It's, uh, I don't really like it. I, I often ask, uh, when I'm asked to do, I often, if I have something else to do, I say, look, uh, give it to someone else. I don't want to. Okay, so very little requirement. So the uh, key requirements <coughs> are the end and mind pack reproduction control system. Clear specification, design, drawings, and calculations, detailed drawings, tolerances, execution classes, materials specified, grades, okay? And uh, fabricators are required to do a contract review. Most of them will have a, a checklist. A contract review is it's an internal audit, really. So there'll be a, a checklist designed that uh, the fabricator will do while he's standing for a job. Do I have, do my weld procedures cover the welding in this job? Can I get the materials? Can I get the grades? Are those materials readily available? Do I have to wait? Are uh, my welding plants calibrated and in date? So it, it's an internal audit document, really. It is a, a requirement. I have to do it, okay? Then you have a capable weld process, weld procedures. Um, we'll discuss weld procedures a bit more, which a bit more detail uh, at the end. Uh, competent people, qualified welders, responsible welding coordinator, WRWC, designers, inspectors, uh, responsibilities defined, okay? Uh, so as part of the FPC, of the FPC system, um, at the very start, you have to define the responsibilities there, uh, who does what, where your job ends and the next guy job uh, starts. We all have to be part of uh, the FPC system. Control of materials, uh, material sorts, when you're talking about uh, steel, there has to be uh, traceability. There's different levels of traceability through the different execution classes. And here we are looking at purchase orders, okay, specifying uh, grades, things like that. We are looking at the delivery dockets and we are looking at new sorts, okay, checking carbon value against the grade and new sorts. <coughs> That's all checked on, uh, on audits. Welding wire, you check the welding wire. Uh, is the welding wire uh, grade? the same as the weld procedure. The European standard uh, does not allow the change. Let's say there are two main grades here in Ireland uses either SG2 or SG3 grade of welding wire, okay? So if the weld pro procedure is doing SG2, you shouldn't be, you cannot use SG3. So you have to use the SG2 grade. So for, for instance, if, if we go out, out auditing, we look at the weld procedure, that is uh, SG2 used for qualifying the weld procedure. And then you go inspection your welding plant, you open the wire feeder, there's SG3 wire inside of it, welding a, a C mark job, major normal parts. Okay. Um, the American welding standard allows the change, but the European standard does not allow the change of the grade of welding wire, okay? And it has to be C marked. All right. Uh, so documentation, FPC manual, inspection and test quality plan, procedures. Record retention, it's, uh, it's 10 years, okay? It's 10 years is the, is the minimum requirement for all uh, uh, document retention here. So all the documentation required to uh, see mark a job have to be kept for a minimum of 10 years unless it's specified on the contract. Uh, control of purchase products and services, clearly defines orders capable subcontractor suppliers. Again, fabricators have to have an approved list, a list of approved suppliers and subcontractors. So have to check people's uh, and companies' qualifications and accreditation. Are people uh, competent to do uh, any subcontractor work? Uh, steel materials, finishes, coats, heat treatment, paint, subcontracted welding. Again, any, any welding that subcontractor got to make sure that Whoever is being subcontracted to holds the execution class, the qualification to the correct execution class to, uh, and obviously well procedures to, to cover whatever well is being subcontracted. Okay, 
equipment, again, calibration of equipment. Um, have to have a list of uh, capability of handling equipment, forklifts park park and, and, and donkey cranes, things like that. Controlled manufactured, uh, fabricated products identified, welders, traceable inspection and testing before, during, and after welding. Okay, again, going back to 3834, this is one of the clauses out of 3834. Has to be inspection before, during, and after welding. Okay, inspection before welding is uh, checking the, the steel really. Do I have the correct grade? Is the steel clean uh, prior to welding? Is there any contamination? Okay, any any paint, any oil, any grease, anything that might uh, cause uh, bother to the welding process. Uh, inspection during welding is uh, checking is the welding procedure being followed. When we get to the weld procedure, we, you, you will notice that there is uh, clear instructions on numbers, bolts, okay, uh, type of current, welding wire, feed speed, travel speed, heat input, uh, grades of wire, type of gas. So inspection during weld is checking all of that. Is the welder working according to the weld procedure? For instance, if, if your weld procedure specifies 240, 240 amps as a minimum. If he's welding at 200 amps, he's doing the wrong thing. So like play with the knob, turn it off, okay? That's all part of inspection during welding. After welding is usually inspection, checking quality, checking dimensions, are the sizes correct, okay? And ob obviously looking out for any uh, uh, visible uh, defects, okay? Um, <coughs> Excuse me. And non destructive testing where required. Okay, we are going to look at table 24 in a minute, is, uh, is to do with the requirement for uh, non destructive testing. Some jobs require it, so other jobs uh, don't. It depends on uh, material thicknesses, grades, and execution classes. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, Okay, so this basically going into uh, audit checks, okay? I'm going to skip forward. Yeah, skip that. Yeah, it's good. most of it is, has been uh, mentioned uh, already. So it's basically audit checks, okay? It's, uh, it's what uh, an auditor's checklist for EN 1092 will uh, entail. Okay. Uh, okay, so we mentioned the thermal coaching there a while ago. So the EN 1092-2 2018, uh, has the addition of Annex D, which uh, automated thermal coaching has to be tested, okay? Um, so you're talking about your CNC uh, plasmas and laser machines. So this is basically the shape that needs to be coached, okay? The shape of a letter P, there's a hole there. So that, there are three tests done to it. First thing is the range of thickness. So let's say, uh, let's call a minimum of six millimeter, okay? And then the maximum be whatever that a particular machine can coat uh, comfortably. It's usually 25 or 30 millimeters is the, is the maximum of what most machines uh, will coat. So tests don't do it. Force test is a hardness test on the surface here, okay? The, the thermal coat surface. So there will be a few indentations along the coat here to check hardness. Is the heat input from the, the thermal coating process changing the, the hardness of the, the steel? Okay. Second test is a perpendicularity test. I don't know if you ever notice, sometimes if you look at a plate coat by a plasma, especially, you have a little uh, chamfer on the, on the coat. So there is a limit to that perpendicularity according to a thickness, uh, according to the standard. Okay. And the third test is a surface roughness test. So it's basically a little kind of a microscope. You take a picture of the, the surface and you measure the size of the, the grooves caused by the, the flame or the plasma or the laser, okay? So those th three tests are doing. The main thing really here is the hardness test, okay? The results of the hardness reading uh, shouldn't be going too high. Uh, that's the main one. So anyone doing thermal coating has to have that thermal coating procedure. Approved. Okay. Um, so that's the document there. Uh, getting close to the end here. 
It's just a clarification on the scope of the entire <coughs> you have the list there of the 57 items, types of structure that are uh, covered by the scope of the N1090. There's another few there that are not covered, okay? Uh, just an example of a sort, we were discussing here at the, at the start, there were a couple of people listening, but we go through it again so everyone uh, get an idea. I'm not sure if you can all see those dates, it's a bit blurry. But this is a typical uh, certificate issued by a notified body to uh, a competency uh, structure steel fabricator, okay? So this one, for instance, is approved by UCAS, okay? It's from the Center for Assessment, which is UK date, so which is UCAS, the United Kingdom Accreditation Service. A, the equivalent in Ireland is INAB, Irish National Accreditation Board, which OMNI is uh, surveyed by. Okay, um, we have there the pleasure of their visits at least two or three times every year. So what they do is basically they come, they go to the office, check all the documentation, and they usually come along with uh, for two or three days with with, with a note for just checking and <clears throat> have we gone mad or not. So um, the problem here was at the start that the Node Five bodies were issuing three-year sorts. That date there is the 14th of August of 2017, okay? So that was the day of the audit when the, 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 a particular ABC uh, engineering was uh, approved, okay? Then you have the expiry date is the 14th of August of 2020. But this is subjected to an annual surveillance, okay? So, a few smart people, when they look at that date, they were, they were not having the, the, the annual surveillance. And the notified body couldn't do a thing about it because the date is there in the sort. So there was no annual surveillance. He was using his source for the three years. And then he'll come back at the end of the third year looking for a new certification. Okay. Um, so that has changed. So it's just something to watch out for. Okay. If you see those three year sorts, just make sure uh, the annual surveillance is happening. Because if the annual surveillance is not happening, the notified body will withdraw the sort. Uh, but no, nobody knows about it unless you actually read the notified body, which that company's name and the certificate number, and actually ask the question Is these people, are these people still C certified? Okay. It was a bit of a gray area at the start, but it doesn't happen anymore. Today you get a, a search for, uh, from the August of 2019, it's going to expire August of 2020. That's it. A new search is issued for one surveillance visits. That's how, that's how it works uh, those days. Okay, that's the end of it. So uh, that's a typical uh, welding procedure uh, done to uh, ISO 15614, okay? So, uh, the way it works is you're going to have a preliminary welding procedure specification where a welding engineer will uh, have a look at uh, what type of structures is being manufactured, um, thicknesses and grades, and will devise on things like uh, uh, amps, bolts, okay, uh, things like that, wire, welding wire grade, and whatever type of gas. So. That is, those parameters are used to actually do the well testing, okay? So once all those tests, as I mentioned, that they start to happen, you were talking about there for fillet welds, you were talking about uh, fracture tests, you were talking about visual inspection, magnetic inspection, um, what else goes into fillet welds, uh, macroscopic examination, and then into fillet, into both welds, you were talking about band tests, you were talking about tensiles, uh, ultrasonic tests, or X-rays. So it's tested to the last, okay, to destruction. So you have your WTPR well procedure qualification record where you have all the, the details of the weld, the welding process and the systems is mag. It's a fillet weld, uh, multi-pass because it qualifies uh, both uh, multi-pass and single passes. You have the range of thicknesses. Um, there's a whole variety of things required here. Wire grades, okay, uh, that's the grade there, SG3, wire size, diameter, the type of gas used, um, polarity, uh, things like that, okay, uh, positions. 
Um, the one thing that's worth mentioning here is, uh, first of all, well procedures will have range of thickness that it uh, approves, okay? Just get to the actual well procedure specification. So this, this here is a, a typical example of a macroscopic examination of a, a T fillet well. So there's a plate stand here, there's a, a base plate there, that's a multi-pass fillet well. So there's a well there, a second well here, and a third well over the top. So that's what the macroscopic examination is. Cross section on top of the plate, it gets polished with proper discs and acids and things like that. Uh, a picture is taken with a high definition camera magnified by <coughs> five to ten times. If you're looking at the real picture, you can even see the line, a clear line between the three wells. Sometimes you can even see the grains of the steel in the well. So it's a very detailed exam. We are looking for the penetration here, okay? How much penetration is there? Is there enough penetration? Any porosity, any odd lines inside the well? That's what is being looked at there. And those are all the readings of the the hardness tests, okay? So there's torque readings, torque indentations going. Um, that's what the test is. That's a typical welder qualification, okay? The standard for welder's qualification that associates with the N1090 is the NISO 9606. 2017 is the latest version, okay? So what that standard says, there's one interesting thing here at the bottom. I don't know if you probably won't be able to see it there. You see that the very, very bottom there, prolongation for uh, the following six months by the coordinator or the employer. So that standard 9606 says that if a particular welder does not work to the company's weld procedure for six months, he has to be retested. So the employer or the welding coordinator has to sign off each sort every six months, stating that a particular welder is actually working, okay, to the particular welding procedures. So that's a typical welding procedure specification there, okay. This needs to be available, posted at the workshop. This is work instruction, okay. This is reference for the welders. So as once everything is tested, there will be someone witnessing the weld on test day, so you get a range for amps and, amps and volts. In here is between 180 and 220 amps. There's a, a range for uh, volts, the polarity of the current, uh, wire feed speed, travel speed, and heat input, okay? Uh, range of thickness up there. Six millimeter to 24 millimeters, which means that the plate thickness used for this test was 12 millimeters, because it actually doubles so 12 mil was used for test, it doubles to 24, it goes down to 6 millimeter. So that's the range of cover of this well procedure, for instance. If 15 millimeter plate was used, it would go up to 30 mil, maximum 7, 7.5 as a minimum. Things to watch out for, okay? A MIG, a MAG welding procedure only covers MAG process. It does, does not cover MIG or TIG or rod welding. Each welding process requires a, uh, a specific welding procedure to be approved. So in that you have your filler material designation and grade here, okay? And as well as the type of gas. M24 there is the, the grade of gas here in this case, okay? Um, as well as the other thing that uh, people get wrong here a lot of times is the welding position. This one. Let's go back up to the. Okay, so the welding position in this here was PB, position B, horizontal vertical. So that T joint was sitting here on top of a bench and the weld was doing in horizontal vertical position. That only covers, if you think of welding positions, uh, that's if you think we were welding this room, for an example. If we are welding the, the two floors together, it's PA position. <coughs> if we were welding the floor to the wall, that corner is PB position. If we are welding the two walls here, it's PC position. Up there is PD. The two ceilings welding, it's, uh, it's, it's overhead, it's PG. Then you have PF is vertical low, PG is vertical down. So PB in this case will only qualify position B position B and position A. So if there is a vertical low weld or an overhead weld on the project, 
this well procedure does not cover. So there has to be a new well procedure approved. Okay. That's all I have for you. Okay, there's a, some watch wells there, but it's the same thing. So. Thank you, Humberto. I won't take you long because I know we're running over earlier. The reason uh, Humberto's um, concentrating on, on development is most fabricators out there have they do three wells, a single pass and a multi pass and a pipe to place. Uh, and it's all done on flat, the PB. Um, they are supposed to, when an engineer sits in the draw and say, okay, we can't put this in the flat, we have to put a vertical up, a vertical well here. They should technically go away and get a procedure done for that. That doesn't happen. And that's something we're trying to uh, to, 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 uh, to work on and, and get right. So that's the reason we, we concentrate on that for a, for a little bit more there. Five years ago, a fabricator could just give you a delivery docket. That's all he had, you know. So that is what a fabricator is required to do today to achieve C marking. Um, when a fabricator asks an engineer if you have if you have designed the structure for him, he asks you for your C V and your insurance. Like we, we said there is some chase laid the head off me. It's because the auditor is looking first. You know, he doesn't want it himself, the auditor is going to ask first, and that's why it's asked for. And we also put it across them. What the engineer asks for is what you do. If he wants intermessent paint on that and it's in pink, that's the way you do it. You're a fabricator, you have nothing to do with design. If he asks for, if the engineer asks for 355 steel and you can only get in 275, you ring the engineer and you get confirmation that we are changing, we are making a change, that, and are you acceptable with that? Um, and the reason for that is, again, is if the auditor comes and he find, and the auditor will go through the drawings with the fabricator uh, of a job and you see 275, he'll look at the delivery docket, you've got 355 in on this 204 beam, there's a problem. When an engineer approves, we're slow on approving, but um, on, on, on collection details, um, Technically, the engineer is supposed to come back to the fabricator and say, yes, they're fine. In an e that's a, what an order will ask for as well. And it can't be just, right, John, that's fine, work away. He will want confirmation that those connection details are approved by the engineers. Are we okay with that? And that's why they do come back asking for those, that information. And it's normally a rush job the week before the orders. I, 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 I never introduced my, my name is Pat Henry. I'm technical and compliance at the Irish Association of Steel Fabricators. We have uh, 1,200 members who are steel fabricators, and we have uh, 580 who are PM 1090 compliant. We, um, I suppose, guide the order of the um, consultants of what to do and how what to put in place to implement for when the auditors turn up. We work from uh, the certification hub at Port Leash, where we do well testing, load testing, um, and training for fabricators. We also do a lot of inspections for um, main uh, contractors and engineers for paint and welds and the like of that. Um, other than that, I hope the evening was quite successful and it didn't drag on too long. Okay, just like to. Don't do want to say a few words. Thanks to the lads there just before we break up. So, listen, um, listen thank you very much. I'm very happy to have the people here. And um, just one other thing on my, on my own, quick I say, if, if some of you are listening there, and to be fair, um, Umberto went through a lot of the detail in all the execution plans there. The actual implementation of this, like you've got everything there, but the implementation plan isn't that difficult, right? And it isn't going to draw a whole lot of. Um, Procedure that been inside your organization is actually quite simple, and that's very important. It, it is, yeah. And, and to install or to set yourself up for, for to be CE marked, the only thing is it isn't that expensive either. Maybe that's an important message. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not. It, it, it's uh, putting put this in place, it sounds a lot, you know, but it, it's, it, they're all small things, you know. And a lot of fabricators are doing it all along, but instead of the Every time you go into a file, they went into the arse pocket or the washing sheet. You know, now there's a place for us. And the whole thing is traceability. And 
Don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> don't say any standard is if something goes wrong, you can blame someone else. You know, we stand us there to get work right. But we we have a project in Jumpdown at the moment and um, there's CHSs and there's French CHSs that come up and there's cracks in it. Now it was done before C came out. So we've got to go through all the tests of everything. We need to test the well, the steel, absolutely everything. If this was a C job, the fabricator could open the file. He could tell me that he bought the uh, welding wire from Kenny's or whoever. He knows it was BOC gas. He knows where his steel came from. Cell cells fade. They went to heat. He knows we call it drilling. And that's the whole thing of it, you know? Now he's put it all together. You know, so it, 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 it is traceability. That's what it's all about. And to do a standard of steel is the same thing as doing a lamp chop that's a super light. It's going through the same process. We know where the, the ram of the father of that lamp was two years ago, Grace India. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> 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 in the usual manner, if you come around the hotel together, it's a good one.